Are we ready to go? All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, for coming to our session. I know you have a lot of uh, interesting talks to uh, discover uh, today. Uh, first, I would like to start with a warning. Uh, we will have some good demos, but they were nowhere near the keynote demo, so I think they set us all up for failure uh, today, uh, but we will try our best. Um, so let me first introduce the speakers. Uh, since we have quite a few uh, speakers today, I really wanted to give you an overview of what's going on in the mobile space and YouTube. Uh, so we will have Andrei Doronichev, uh, who is the product manager uh, for YouTube Mobile. He's the guy behind, the guy behind our uh, wonderful YouTube Mobile app. Uh, he will uh, talk a little bit about the past and the future of YouTube Mobile. Uh, we will have uh, guest speakers uh, from Flipboard, Arthur and Jason, uh, and they re have recently launched uh, YouTube API integration, so this is very fresh. Now uh, you'll be able to learn uh, about their experience. Hopefully they will not say anything bad about our performance, uh, but uh, we'll see. Um, then we have uh, Kiran uh, Belubi from 955 Dreams. They build beautiful uh, mobile consumption experiences. Uh, he will give us a demo of his app. And uh, Krishna Menon, uh, from WeVideo, uh, they focus on creation. So we'll talk a little bit about their architecture and what they're doing with, uh, with their app. Uh, together with me, I also have my buddy, uh, Shannon J.J. Behrens. Uh, he'll lead the panel discussion uh, towards the end of, of, of this talk. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, we'll talk about you know, what's uh, in it uh, for uh, YouTube and, and for you developers uh, when it comes to mobile video, uh, and then uh, we'll talk about specific three areas that we are focusing on. The traditional strength of YouTube, which is you know, creation and platform for content creation. Uh, we'll talk about curation, which is something new uh, that we have been working on, and we have a wonderful developer ecosystem around it as well. A lot of innovative uh, companies trying to surface uh, content. And then uh, we'll talk about beautiful consumption experience. And again, for all three of them, we'll talk about what we do to enable it from API standpoint, and then give you an example, uh, real life applications. At the end, we'll have a panel discussion uh, where uh, uh, JJ has some tough questions to our participants, and then you're welcome to join us and ask your questions as well. Uh, so first, I would like to uh, introduce Andre, uh, product manager of YouTube Mobile, and then he will talk a little bit about the past and the present and the future of YouTube Mobile. Thank Thanks, you, Andre. Sir. Here you go. Hey guys, I wish I could land like skydive down here on stage. Fortunately, I didn't today. I'm, I lead product management for YouTube on mobile across our devices and mobile website, and I want to talk a little bit about opportunity that we see in mobile video. You know, when we launched YouTube mobile back in 2006, it was as many good products. It was a toy, a toy for engineers, a baby product. Well, guess what? It's grown up a lot since then. Today, we're streaming 600 million playbacks per day on mobile devices. Numbers are huge. Today, uh, hundreds of millions on, of phones and tablets can access full YouTube experience. Uh, and what we really see is how the user perception is changing. So for many users today, mobile is becoming the dominant way of accessing YouTube. Another trend that we see is that a lot of users see mobile YouTube as a core feature of their device. They just expect it to be there. Like those guys, these are my kids, by the way. These guys, they just don't have a concept of, hey, this video is not in the device. For them, any touch screen phone or tablet they can grab is sort of a magical portal that allows to play any video they have in mind instantly. Now, you may say these guys are biased, and they may be, but look at our stats. As I said, 600 million uh, playbacks per day. But what is most fascinating is the pace at which it gr is growing. 3x year on year, just in the past year. Three hours of mobile video uploaded every single minute. So far, our goal with mobile was just to make it work. Right? We wanted to deliver great, consistent YouTube experience across all sorts of mobile platforms. And the way we achieved that was the decision we made a couple of years ago to focus on Android application as our core experience, as the place where we showcase new features and try out new stuff, and then scale it ac across platforms uh, via HTML5. That worked really well, and today you can access YouTube uh, in, from your BlackBerry OS device or Windows Phone or iOS, Android, pretty much any modern smartphone or tablet. Now, what's next? Uh, 
you know, the world is changing, and YouTube is definitely not a website anymore. YouTube is this ecosystem of different devices accessing the cloud of video. And it's becoming more and more channel-centric. So as you have seen already with the site redesign uh, on desktop, we are, we are seeing ourselves as the platform for the world of hundreds of millions of channels. So what we want to achieve with mobile going forward is to turn it into daily ritual, this application that gives you access to all your subscriptions wherever you are instantly. So let's say you have 10 minutes to spare on the bus. You could just grab your phone, open your feed of subs subscription updates, and instantly watch whatever you want to watch. Now, it would take us some work to get there. We're quite not there yet. <laughs> and here's our strategy how to, we want to get there. First of all, we need to improve consumption experience a lot. We acknowledge that. Um, second of all, monetization is very important to bring content to mobile. We need to make sure that content creators have incentive to, to shift the usage from desktop to mobile. Otherwise, they wouldn't just, uh, just enable videos for mobile consumption. And finally, well, they, you know how they say today, you cannot spell capitalism without API in it. So opening up the ecosystem is very important. Now let me talk about details. Uh, consumption. I'm not sure if you noticed yet, today we launched the new YouTube application for Android, which is bigger than just another update because it's really showcasing our vision of YouTube consumption in the future. First feature that we launched is the new UI focused around channels. We call it the guide. When you launch the app, you instantly get access to all updates from your channels. And if you have a specific channel in mind, like you want to check out the latest TED Talk, for example, you can very easily swipe the UI to the right and, and pick a particular channel you, you care about. Now, OK, you have all this great video surfaced for you. But you know how it happens. You, you're on the bus. You have all this great content. You know there's something really cool there. You try to watch it. The connection is very slow, and it's just a pain. Instead of watching the video, you're watching the spinner. And this is unfortunately, unfortunately true despite all the recent improvements on mobile networks because it really depends on, on many factors. Like right now in Moscone, there are so many mobile devices, the network is just overloaded. So the second feature we're introducing today with this new application, we call Wi-Fi preloading. And it's quite revolutionary in its way. What happens is anytime your phone is on Wi-Fi and charger, we would pre-download video content into it and store it securely on the device. So that next morning, for example, you, know, you weren't charging Wi-Fi overnight. You wake up in the morning, you get on the shuttle, you know, commuting to the office, and you have flaky connection, you go through tunnels and so forth, but the video is already there. So you enjoy flawless HD quality playback in your phone. And this is really a great way to improve uh, your experience on the go. But now, we also acknowledge that, not, that mobile devices are not only used on the go. Truth is, the, the gesture UI is so convenient, the touch UI is so convenient, that many times you find yourself like chilling out on the sofa and then you just, you know, instead of standing up and turning on your laptop, you grab your phone and uh, explore YouTube on it. Now, touch screen is very good for exploring and engaging with videos, but video itself was created to be watched on a big screen TV. So the third feature we launched in this new UI is Play On. This allows you to connect, your, to pair your phone with a TV in the room or a smart TV in your room or like a you know, TiVo box or Nexus Q that was presented, was presented today. And this way, you can take both of, or, or take best of both worlds. You're using the UI on the phone to navigate the site and pick the video to watch, and you're using the big screen TV to play it. Now, the best thing is that unlike uh, mirroring technologies, here everything's happening through the cloud. So while your TV is playing the video, you can continue exploring YouTube with your phone, uh, or you can just leave the YouTube app and keep it playing there. Now, to recap, the way we see consumption in the future, three things. It's channel-centric, it's optimized for streaming on the go, and it makes devices in the living room work together in a way it makes sense. 
Now switching the gears, the second pillar of our strategy, as I said, is monetization. And it is important because giving great monetization options to our content creators, we unlocking content on YouTube on mobile. And this is a very, uh, th this is a very common problem with many devices today when you cannot play some of the videos because content creators just didn't feel like enabling them. We want to make sure that they have incentive and they have great options to, to enable their content for devices. Now for advertisers, mobile ads on YouTube are actually quite cool because unlike many other properties that struggle with mobile monetization, in the case of YouTube, the video format, video ad format is very well understood and uh, it brings a lot of value to advertisers, so they're willing to pay more for it. Finally, by introducing skippable formats, we're giving users the choice to only watch relevant uh, ad content, which is also quite great. And finally, as I said, third pillar of our strategy is you guys. We've seen a lot of uh, success on, on, with mobile video recently, and we really want to share it with you. Well, of course, we don't want you to use the API to build clones of YouTube application or um, you know, do things that are prohibited by our policy, like downloading content. But we see it as an opportunity to explore new use cases around embedding videos into existing products or building video-centric applications, like uh, apps for content creation, curation, or uh, different ways of discovering videos. So to sum up, Mobile video had seen a lot of success, uh, and uh, it's growing really fast right now, but the ecosystem is in the very early stage. It's the very beginning. There is a lot of opportunity with mobile video, and we really hope that you guys will take it to new heights. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Andre. All right, so now, uh, first of all, quick question for you guys. Who in the room has used YouTube APIs? Oh, wow. Great. Uh, so you don't really need this. Uh, for those of you that haven't, a quick refresher. We have a two set of APIs, data APIs and player APIs. Data APIs allow you to integrate with our backend. So pretty much everything you can do on YouTube.com, you can do programmatically in your application. Player APIs allow you to customize the playback behavior. And uh, yeah, going back to our uh, topic of this talk, uh, we will transition into specific APIs relevant to the three uh, main, main use cases that we would like to promote. Uh, before we get there though, uh, does anybody know what this is? Exactly, so uh, when, you, when I see this painting, it, it, it puts creation in my mind. So we'll talk about creation. Uh, what APIs are relevant uh, to content creation uh, on mobile? Well, first of all, uh, you need authorization in your application so the user can upload a video into their account. And uh, in the old times, people use client login. This is now deprecated, and we are all using auth too, right? Quiet. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, that is not the case. We're trying to make it easier, however, um, in two ways. One is uh, Android is actually introducing a new uh, way of obtaining an auth through token, uh, Google Auth Util. And there's a code sample of how we use it uh, right here below. As you can see, it's actually quite simple. Uh, you invoke uh, Google Auth Util Authenticate method. Uh, you provide the username and the sp scope for the token. Uh, you can get a bunch of exceptions. Uh, for example, if the user hasn't authorized yet, uh, you get a uh, user recoverable auth exception. Uh, if the system is overloaded, you get a transit exception telling you to retry later. And then if things are really bad, you get a failure exception, exception and that means don't bother, <laughs> you can just give up right now. Um, so this is Android, um, and for iOS we have uh, all through touch controller. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is open source code that wraps the web view, makes it very easy to incorporate uh, all of flow into your application. Uh, another thing that is important uh, for upload application is resumable uploads. Uh, so if you have not used them in your mobile apps, uh, check it out. Uh, really the fundamental part about it is it uses the content rage uh, mechanism from HTTP, and here's a code snippet of how you can use that in your application if you're not using a client library. Really, the gist of that is you can query the system to figure out, you know, how many bytes have been uploaded if the connection drops. Uh, so this gives you, you know, more than, than a day to complete an upload. So if somebody creates a big video, you can keep trying in the background, keep pushing some bytes, 
querying to see how much uh, content has been uploaded and, and re received by us, and then try again until the completion. So that makes actually the upload experience uh, a lot less frustrating for the user. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, you know, metadata is very important. Uh, we drive uh, video discovery through metadata, uh, related video content, and so forth. So a couple of pieces that are important. Uh, the developer key, uh, so you can monitor the performance of your application. Uh, we actually grant more quota uh, for applications that identify themselves with the developer key. It's actually required for uploads. Uh, some people don't know about this little trick here. Uh, you can actually add additional tags uh, to your upload that are scoped within the developer key. So they are not uh, searchable on YouTube.com. They are not visible in the user metadata, but they are visible in your um, application. Uh, so then, for example, you can encode additional information about uh, the upload that is meaningful to your application. It may not be meaningful to YouTube. It's totally opaque to us. And uh, you know, location information, uh, APIs allows you to, to submit uh, the uh, uh, markup uh, that identifies the location of the upload. Obviously, you need uh, the user's permission. Uh, but that is very handy because then you can query for videos, for example, within specific radius and so forth. So here's you know, one example of how I typically do this. Without a client library, you can just create a template, uh, populate it uh, with the metadata, and then you will get back, uh, you will actually post a document that kind of looks like this one uh, with all the major pieces of the metadata. Here's my developer tag that I was talking about and my uh, geolocation information. So um, to put it in context, uh, I put a quick app together that allows you to basically um, capture a video. Uh, let's launch it. So I'm actually asking for the account. I want to use my account. And then what this app does is actually it records video from the camera, uh, but it does it uh, frame by frame and uh, applies a nice little effect uh, to the video frames uh, as they are received. So I'm um, recording our panelists, and then I can then uh, add the metadata. So I'm using the uh, tags that we were talking about. And then submit, agree to terms of service. And now I'm using reasonable upload to upload the video to YouTube. OK, so this is my little uh, demo. We'll come back to it a little later. Uh, but you know, I'm not a pro, um, so I would like to now transition to pros that actually build content creation application um, and introduce Krishna uh, from uh, WeVideo. Over to you, Krishna. Hi everybody, my name is Krishna Menon. I'm the CTO for VVideo. And uh, today I wanted to talk to you about our cloud-based video editor, which we've obviously integrated uh, with YouTube. Uh, but before I get started, uh, I wanted to show you a, a short video clip. And hopefully the idea here is to give you an idea of what the platform is capable of doing in terms of the capabilities for video editing. Now, just to set it in context, uh, this video was created as part of a marketing campaign uh, for the movie Avengers. And for lack of a better name, uh, it's a process, I'll call it uh, uh, crowdsourcing of uh, movie trailers. So they put a bunch of uh, short video clips from the movie up on our platform and then invited users to come in and use our editor to create a trailer. So this was created on, completely on our platform by somebody who's not a professional video editor. War has started. And we are hopelessly outgunned. We're not a team. We're a time bomb. 
Well, this was very well done, and hopefully you noticed that uh, the kinds of effects that were done, and also how the audio and video effects were synchronized, and all of that was done on V Video by really a non-professional editor. Uh, so now a little bit about what uh, the architecture for V Video. So it's completely cloud-based. If you look up on the top, uh, it's in the cloud. The content is delivered using a CDN. Uh, the storage could be uh, either our storage. We also integrate with Google Drive. So the content itself could be sitting on a, uh, another cl cloud storage system. In terms of applications, we have applications both for the consumer and the prosumer. And we also like to cover uh, all the different devices. So we've got applications for smartphones, uh, tablets, and the desktop. And what I'm going to do is quickly show you some of the user experiences on the, on the smartphone and the tablet so you can see what are the kinds of things we do on those applications. And so. Uh, so the first, first thing I want to do is just bring up our camera application. So this is intended for the smartphone. The idea here is that uh, for us, this is an acquisition device, but it's also, it also gives you the ability to uh, trim content. So it also allows you to uh, apply effects and also share it to YouTube. So we look at the projects here, and if I pick one of the projects, and I want to add some content, so what it allows you to do is upload content from your gallery uh, or record a video or take a picture. I'm not going to record a video here, but I do have something in the gallery. I did go ahead and record uh, Jarek when he was talking. So if I just load that up, and obviously I can play it out here. And then what I can do is I can kind of trim it if I wanted to cut out parts of it. So, all that, so for us, everything is in real time. So any trimming or applying effects, uh, we want to avoid the rendering process. Everything needs to be done in real time. So we'll try to preview it. And the key to that is we use proxy files for the content. So we use a lower bitrate file, uh, but gives you the same kind of user experience. Uh, once I'm done with my trimming, I can do a style and share. Uh, since this is intended for a smartphone, uh, you, you know, we try to optimize it for the real estate. So we have these things called themes. And themes are uh, automated effects, uh, which apply both video effects and also audio to it. Uh, so if I wanted to go ahead and say, apply a memories theme to that and play it. And so, or if I didn't like that and I said I want to change it to a passion, again, it's all real time, and I can, and I can look at it. And so once I've done that, the last step is uh, I'll, I'll go in and, and I'll share it to YouTube, uh, and that's kind of the, the, uh, the smartphone process. Now, all of this gets stored in a server, so if I wanted to continue editing, I could go back and uh, work on my tablet version, which obviously gives, uh, takes advantage of the larger real estate. So if I go to the tablet version, you'll see that no, it's actually a full-blown editor. It, uh, it's got a timeline. Um, it's got a timeline with it, a lot more effects, uh, titles, uh, audio recording, and things like that. So again, I've got that project here. Uh, and I'll open that up. And I'll just start off creating a new movie. Now, we have this concept of a wizard. So again, we're trying to attract uh, the product. We're trying to go for the breadth of users. If, you're not a, if you don't want to do the editing, we also have a wizard that allows you to quickly create a movie. And I'll go in and I'll you know, pick some videos. And uh, So this is Jarek talking right here. But, but I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and use something else. So I'll pick a couple of clips, drag it in. I'll pick another one. Oops. And then what I can also do is, and if I just want to play that, obviously now I've got put, I've put two clips together. And if I wanted to go ahead and put some effects on that, uh, we've got a big selection of effects in the application. And I'll just go ahead and you've got animations, patterns, uh, you know, I'll do a 3D horizontal effect at the transition there. And then I'll just move it so we don't have to watch the whole thing. So as it, as it goes the transition, you'll see a little effect. So all of this has been happening in real time as it goes on. And, uh, and then I can add some uh, titles to it, or I can add some audio to it. So the idea is that, again, we want to do as much of this as in real time as possible. 
Uh, and once, once I'm done editing, I just publish it to YouTube, and uh, that process happens in the background as you go along. Okay. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what the product is capable of doing. Now let me talk a little bit about, um, okay, so core technologies, so obviously I talked a little bit about this. We support multiple devices uh, across multiple apps. Uh, uh, Quick thing about it, uh, if you look at the fourth bullet there, uh, proxy. So that's how we do a lot of the editing. We take the high res file, create a lower bit rate uh, uh, proxy. That's how we get the efficiency and performance during the editing process. Uh, again, the idea is uh, you want to be able to make quick changes and preview it. And since it's all based in the cloud, the whole process of publishing to YouTube is all done through a scalable form that we have, encoding form that we have up on the, uh, in our cloud infrastructure. Uh, just kind of the, looking at the end-to-end -end workflow, so uh, we integrate both with Google Drive and YouTube. So Google Drive is where all the content sits. Uh, so what we have is that we have a process that uh, just watches the Google Drive folders to see any new content comes in. When that comes in, we pick it up, create the proxy, and then that's available for editing. And then you have the option of putting the published edits on YouTube, or you can also store it back to your, store it back to your Google Drive. Lastly, talking a little bit about the integration points. Obviously, authentication happens through OpenID and OAuth. Uh, the publishing process, um, it's basically uh, when the user decides to publish it, we go through the timeline, uh, create a single file of it, about, and then use the, uh, the GData YouTube API, API to publish it to YouTube. And then the drive integration, as I mentioned, uh, happens through uh, synchronizing our CMS uh, with the drive folder so we can pick up the new media files, create the proxy, and do the editing. And all of that is done through the Drive API and the Docs uh, Doc API. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Krishna. I thought you were going to leave that tablet for me. All right. So uh, a lot of interesting thing happens on the back end uh, with that application. Uh, so now let's talk about something else. Uh, again, another picture for you to uh, guess what it is. Any thoughts come to your mind when you see this? Bilbao. Yeah, so uh, the way I see it is, you know, beautiful content in beautiful settings, uh, which is what content curation is all about. And uh, so let's chat a little bit about the APIs that we have that enable that, uh, and then give you an example of a, of, a, of a great app that uses them. So uh, if you use the Google Data APIs, you see that we actually have um, a set of uh, content discovery APIs. For example, you can search for videos, you can search for channels, you can find out what videos are related. And this is very simple. You know, you can invoke an HTTP request. Uh, it gives you a set of uh, entries that corresponds to um, videos that match your search criteria. In this case, I was actually asking for all uh, Minecraft-related videos. Uh, we have some APIs that are really relevant uh, for curation. For example, uh, we have um, an API which allows you to figure out what's hot on YouTube right now. Uh, and um, if you have been uh, using the standard feeds in your app, you will notice there is an on the web feed. Uh, so you can actually query to figure out, you know, tell me what's, what's, what's trending right now. Maybe my user will want to see that and share. So I have a simple query expression here where I'm asking for two uh, top uh, entries uh, from the uh, trends feed. And I'm actually only interested in the entry uh, name and the title. So let me just click on that. And this is always a. Uh, a nice surprise. So here are the two top trending videos right now. Uh, Kite Surfer, Reddington Beach. I uh, wonder if this is better than our keynote demo. Um, and then we have some more uh, uh, APIs coming in this area. So if you're interested in, in, in this type of curation, discovery APIs, uh, get in touch with us uh, because we're always looking for trusted testers. Um, now, <clears throat> if you have access to YouTube's uh, um, account for a specific user, in other words, if they have actually authorized you through OAuth, uh, you can learn more. So for example, you can figure out uh, what videos the user has saved uh, in order to watch later. And uh, if you have, again, uh, been granted the OAuth permission, maybe you can use that to drive uh, their uh, discovery experience. Uh, so to do that, uh, you, know, you can write some, uh, some code to do this, uh, or you can uh, use our uh, handy little uh, OAuth tool. Uh, let me see. This one. Okay. 
So uh, what I can do is I can you know, request the auth token, authorize this uh, application to access my account, fine, uh, get the access token, uh, I got the access and the refresh token, which is nice, and now I can issue an authenticated request. Uh, so I have a request, uh, say, looking for all the videos that I have saved into my watch later feed. Uh, so if I just invoke this operation right here, I'll get a bunch of uh, videos that um, have been uh, saved. If I use the syntax uh, partial rec uh, responses with uh, this fields param, so let me do that, uh, what I'll actually get is only the uh, elements that I have explicitly requested. Um, so you see this is a lot easier to uh, parse, and there is a dude perfect video that I wanted to watch. Didn't have time because I was prepping for IO. I'll watch it tonight if everything goes well. And uh, uh, it's saved into much what my watch later feed. Uh, so again, this is the type of stuff you can do if you have authenticated access to the YouTube account. Now, if you Flipboard, you can also build beautiful applications uh, that use these types of APIs. So I would like, like to introduce uh, Arthur, uh, the CTO of uh, Flipboard, and Jason, uh, who worked on uh, YouTube integration to share their experience. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, my name is Arthur van Hoff. I'm the CTO of Flipboard. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Flipboard. Flipboard is a social magazine. It's a magazine that is curated by your friends, your friends on Twitter, Facebook, and actually since last week on Google Plus and YouTube. And that's why we're here. Um, Flipboard kind of helps you find and discover interesting content. Uh, we're an, uh, originally an iPad application. It's designed for a magazine format, uh, but we've also created an iPhone version, and uh, since last week, we now also have an Android version, which we'll show you. Um, when you get the content, uh, you get it in a paginated format. There's no scrolling in Flipboard, and one of the reasons for that is it sort of makes it a much easier read to find something. You can quickly page through uh, a, a feed, and if you like something, you can tap on it, zoom in, and explore more. Um, for some partners, we have full content. We have partnerships, um, to, so we can show you the whole article, and for some content, you can only see an excerpt, and we send you to the original website. Uh, Flipboard is already supported video for uh, since the launch. We supported a YouTube video playback uh, as early as two years ago. Um, but we were not allowing you to log in to your YouTube account and get all your personal subscriptions and also to interact with the video, add comments and see the comments and, and like videos, etc. That is what has been, been added. Um, so, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jason, who did a lot of the actual hard work of implementing this before we launch into a quick demo. So uh, we use the pure YouTube data API, uh, the RESTful interfaces, all the JSON. Um, you know, we're, we're using the search APIs for users for videos so you can find people uh, to follow. Um, all the standard feeds trending on the web, um, you know, most popular. Um, we let you view individual subscriptions or everything that you've subscribed to. It's kind of the default of what you can flip through. Um, we're using all of the, uh, the rating, the commenting. Uh, we allow you to subscribe. Um, and then after we have all this information on, on Flipboard, we can actually surface interesting content uh, from your social graph that's on YouTube. It'll show up in your cover stories. Um, and then we can also aggregate all the stuff that people, all the videos that they're watching on Flipboard themselves, and then, you know, it's what's trending or popular on Flipboard that's on YouTube. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, we try to be smart in the API usage. Um, so we, like I said, we just use JSON. Um, the YouTube format, as you saw, is very verbose, so uh, we actually filter a lot of stuff just to get uh, what we want so we don't transfer too much data, the things that we aren't using. Um, sometimes we put filters, like this filter would just be things that were mobile videos. Actually, we'd probably pretty aggressive if you were to do that filter. Someone will go to their uploads and see a, 
an old video and say, why isn't it here? Because it may not be for the mobile schema, but actually it'll still play on their device. Um, we use uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the query language because we're, we're trying to get, oh, the new stuff in your feed, the new subscription, so we only grab uh, what's required. Um, and you can do that with the API, which is really nice. Um, and, and again, we, we also limit uh, the size of the JSON responses by really digging in and just grabbing the pieces uh, that re are required. So there's actually a new JSON C format. I don't know if everyone uses the API, which is a lot um, uh, cleaner as far as a JSON format versus the, the existing JSON format, which is kind of the exploded XML, but um, not every feed supports it, so actually we don't uh, use that. Um, and now I'll go to uh, Arthur for a demo. Cool. Um, so Flipboard is a magazine, as I was saying, and, and what you're seeing here is the cover page. It basically shows you the selection of stories from your, uh, from, from your Flipboard. Uh, it also shows you on the right all the contributors of those stories. Let it go to another you know, Nexus 7 tablet hands-on video posted. Um, and then I flip over to my, my table of contents and in my table of contents, I immediately see the cover story style at the top. And the cover story style is intended to be a selection of the best content uh, that is selected specially for you. And that's done by looking at your interactions with your friends and content on other networks. So for example, we look at you know, who you uh, plus one in Google Plus, or who you like in Facebook, or what videos you watch in, in YouTube. And, we take all that information and we use that as, as an input for a ranking algorithm that creates the content you might like. So when I tap on that, it takes me to sort of a magazine full of content that was selected for me. Here's an interesting article. I go and tap on that in there. I can read the article. It's a six page article. And I can find out about the Nexus Q. And then when I keep going, it goes on to the next article and some photos about it. Um, I can also go, let me go back. I can also go and get some new content. If I open the dra content drawer here, you'll see featured content. Um, you, there's news sources, there's business, there's all sorts of different uh, content partnerships you have. I wanna show you one that I like particularly um, with the National Geographic. It's great because it's got really fantastic photographs. Um, so if I go into an article here, then what you'll see, as I'm paging through, you'll occasionally see a full page ad. But that's an ad that's delivered by National Geographic and it's almost sort of part of the experience. It's like you're, when you're reading a magazine, you, you also occasionally see an ad, but it doesn't interrupt the flow of reading so much. And also what's very important, you never see it sort of half. You never sort of scrolled half of the page, which is very important for people that are into magazine layout. Um, let me show you some videos playing, which is very important. Let's go to trending videos. Um, this is the view that you get when you go to a, a, a YouTube feed. Uh, this is uh, the usual selection of fun videos. Let's play one here. Um, I, have never, I have not watched this one, but it's, I'm sure it's gonna be great. So the audio is coming out of the, of the iPad, which you don't hear, but so this is great. Um, I can also pull up any comments by tapping down here and I can immediately see all the comments. This is coming in through the YouTube APIs. And if I like this video, I can just hit the thumbs up button and off we go. And this is because I'm already signed into my YouTube account. So the interaction is, is very, very simple. Um, it's also live and let me do a refresh here. Um, get an update of the latest. And what is this video here? Oh, that's the video that Jarek just made. Let me see what that turned out to be. Play. It's a wonderful video, for sure. Come on, play. Oh, I have to hit pause, sorry. What a wonderful effect, Jarek. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as you can see, it's live and it, it really does work. Um, last thing I want to show you is, um, so I, you can also do searches, by the way. This is a search for the 
IO12 tag, and it shows you posts on Google Plus from, from the conference, which I, I really like. I also want to really briefly, briefly show you this working on this wonderful device that occasionally works. You, there we go. And that box is going to go away. Yes, perfect. There's a widget on your on the top on your phone. If I tap on that, it takes me to Flipboard, and I got the same kind of layout except that the paging is now vertical rather than horizontal because this is a portrait device. So again, I got the same video over here. If I go into my cover stories, I get to read my cover stories and interact with them. If I see a video I like, I can just tap on it and immediately get all the comments and give feedback. Um, so there you have it. Flipboard on Android, Flipboard on iPad, Flipboard integrated with YouTube. It's awesome. And it's free. <laughs>
can we switch to, yeah. So um, let me tell you what we mean by experience first and how that sort of relates to YouTube. Uh, this is band of the day on the uh, iPad. Let's go to today's band. Every day we feature one band. The music is essentially full play. I don't know if you guys can hear that now, but anyway. We have uh, YouTube sort of interspersed in the entire experience for the app. Um, you know, a lot of our users are sort of reading the content. Some of them might enjoy sort of just browsing the videos or just listening to the music on the, uh, as audio. And the experience is really just fluid and works beautifully on the iPad. I can show you the iPhone version as well. Um, this is all the videos for, for this band. And if you switch back to... So we have a few ground rules when we come to, when we talk about sort of using YouTube in our app. Um, and the first one is that we don't like to see loading signs anywhere. Uh, so when we, when we use thumbnails or when we are preloading any of the content for our users, you will never see a loading sign on band of the day. And just small things like this make a huge difference for our users, makes it easier for them, and the experience is just really clean and simple to use. So if you look at um, the YouTube experience within our app, we haven't added comments and things like that yet, but we, we plan to do that very soon. You can share the video with your friend. You can send it to your friend. Um, you can just start, just, just, just start watching the videos directly here. Uh, there are more features coming. Um, that's odd. Let me show this to you on the iPhone really quick. So the same experience, but sort of, you know, more for one-handed navigation. Extremely fluid again. Go to today's band. You can listen to the music. They're full play songs. They aren't clips, as you see it with many other apps. Um, Here you'll see more YouTube videos sort of embedded inside of the experience. Um, everything is preloaded for the users. Thumbnails sort of the one-click play. Um, and it just, it just sort of works. We've had um, any questions that we've had, you know, the, the, the YouTube developers have been really good at answering. But mostly we focus on sort of the, the experience first, keeping it simple, preloading stuff on a mobile device, never showing a loading sign. And we've had some success with, uh, you know, with usage. All right. So a couple of interesting stats from our app. Um, in terms of engagement, 35% of our sessions watch at least one full YouTube video. And this is sort of a really interesting st uh, statistic for us. We noticed um, a lot of prime time usage of, of the product. Um, a lot of the usage of the product was happening in prime time television hours, which was very interesting. So, you know, further sort of solidifying our use of YouTube within our product. 9% um, of uh, the average session length, which is currently 17 minutes, is spent on, on YouTube videos. And this was fascinating for us. So, um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks, uh, Kira. All right, so let's get into uh, Q&A, and uh, to get it started, uh, my uh, buddy JJ is going to lead a panel discussion, so I'm going to ask the uh, external speakers to please uh, come up and questions. I'm going to... Are we ready? Hey, great, we're ready. Um, Yarek has to go give another talk. What room are you going to be speaking in, Yarek? 
Video, mobile video gaming, and what room is that? Number five, that's going to be pretty awesome. We got some super secret awesome stuff coming up in that. But before he leaves, let's give Yadik a round of applause. Okay, so we got a few minutes left, and I want to ask you guys a few questions. Uh, first of all, uh, can you guys tell me what languages you're using to talk to the YouTube APIs. Uh, tell me if you're using a client library and tell me if you're using uh, XML or JSON. We're using Ruby on the back end. Uh, we don't use a client library on iOS. We sort of uh, munch the data on the back end using Ruby and then deal with it ourselves. JSON. Uh, no client libraries. We use the RESTful APIs with JSON. Which language? Java. Same here, Java, OS2, REST, JSON. Great. Uh, so a lot of applications uh, do a mix of talking to YouTube, the YouTube API uh, in real time in response to users, as well as a lot of batch processing. And I know that some of your apps do a lot of background processing. So can you tell me of the breakdown of how much your applications talk to the YouTube API kind of in real time versus batch processing? For uh, Flipboard, uh, most of what you saw Arthur doing, flipping, that's all real time. Uh, but we also, if you, if you sign in with your YouTube account, we're going to uh, basically crawl and look at your subscriptions and stuff. And that's how things will bubble up um, into your cover story. So we actually do do a lot of uh, background processing, too. Um, and we'll also look at you know, all the people you subscribe to. And then if you have other friends, you know, what are they subscribing to so that, that we can do a little social graph computations. Um, but you know, a huge portion of it is going to be real time. We don't do anything real time on the app right now with YouTube, although I think commenting and stuff will require some sort of real time API usage, which we might do soon. Yeah, nothing real time right now. Most of our integration is on the publish, uh, so that's all batch processing. Uh, after the user says publish on the back end, uh, we'll publish it to YouTube. Great. OK, so I've got a squirrely question for you guys. Uh, I want you to tell me about the future of mobile, specifically creation, curation, and consumption. And I want you to tell me what the future is going to look like two years from now, um, you know, five to seven to ten years from now. And then I want you to, you know, throw a Hail Mary and tell me what it's going to be like 50 years from now. Well, I'll address the creation and I'll try to be as realistic as possible. So. Uh, the, the trends we're seeing are that obviously uh, uh, it's uh, video is ubiquitous, it's on every platform. Creation is now happening on mobile devices. Things that used to, were not possible on those platforms are now possible today. Uh, it's becoming more and more mainstream. I think uh, uh, in previous times it used to be creation was 1% of the population. You're seeing a lot more of it and I think that trend is going to continue. Great. On the consumption side, I think as a user, what I'd like to see is more really high quality content. I mean, if you look at uh, what you guys did with Coachella streaming live, you know, this year, I think we want more of that. You know, not everybody can go at 35, 36, you know, to Coachella and Bonnaroo and Lollapalooza, all of them in the same year. Uh, but I'd love to be, you know, a participant in that experience, at least through YouTube on video, hopefully in the next 10 years, maybe there's, there'll be some, uh, uh, y some you know, user-created demographic, uh, you know, a, a democratic way of high-end news that we, that we sort of can consume on YouTube, high, really high quality, almost like 60 minutes. I, mean, I don't know if that's possible on YouTube, but maybe, I mean, I'm hoping. Um. Sort of in the short term, I think that um, you know, search will be interesting in video. Like, how do you find, you know, videos about something without really knowing all the tags? That would be an interesting project, and I know that Google is working on that. Um, in the longer term, um, I'm going to predict that display technology is going to get so cheap that pretty much every every surface is going to be covered with displays. So. He's going to spray them on all the walls. And obviously, they're going to have to be powered by YouTube. So wallpaper powered by YouTube, that's my prediction. <laughs> Great. Um, 
So we have a little bit under three minutes left. Um, can you, uh, is anybody interested in asking a question? And if you do ask a question, you could come up here afterwards. And we have a few uh, YouTube t-shirts. Hey guys, so I have kind of a technical question about the switch to OAuth 2. Um, I don't know if any of you encountered this, but with our app, when we switched to OAuth 2, we ran into a problem with YouTube where Google will happily authenticate a user even if they're not a YouTube account. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll get this access token back, and then when we do an API, we'll get the no linked uh, account uh, response back. And it just feels really clunky. It kind of feels like something we felt that Google should handle on their end. When we say, you know, we want YouTube data, and it's not a YouTube user, they should just be like, no, it's not a YouTube user, instead of pretending like the authentication went fine. So I could answer that. Um, if you look at our YouTube API blog, we have um, a blog post some, that's called something like uh, Google Accounts, and the idea was that we'd like to open up YouTube as much as possible to people who don't have YouTube accounts, and so it's up to you to um, follow the advice in the blog post to correctly handle certain types of users, and then for the users who aren't YouTube, um, users who w are trying to do something that requires uh, YouTube user abilities, um, there are ways basically to help him to upgrade. So the blog post will help you out with that. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm familiar with that, but I mean, could there maybe be an additional scope? Like we need a real YouTube user with a YouTube username, um, and in that case, Google handles it. Why don't you come and okay. we could talk more about that at the Sandbox. All right. And I, uh, if any of you have questions that don't get addressed today, I will be at the Sandbox all day tomorrow. So please don't make me stand there by myself. Okay. I can uh, answer that. So for Flipboard, we have the same, same issue, um, but we don't want to create the user's account. Actually, there's an API where you can just add a name for their channel. But we sort of just pop up a dialog box and say, you need to go to YouTube. Um, but, but we let people browse anonymously too. Okay, I think we could get one more in. Hi, uh, I just have a general question, and I would love to get your thoughts on social cam and what it means, and if it's something that's lasting or flimsy. Arthur, I have a feeling you have an answer. Oh, I'm a big believer in, in the, the Google Glass project and recording your life. The big issue is going to be, again, search. I mean, if I can record 100x as much content, how am I going to filter that down to the relevant parts? So I think that's going to be the big, the big thing. I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by social cam, but um, that's what I think. These, you know. are, you, are you talking about the app social cam? Yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, a lot of people use YouTube in their apps. I mean, so do we. I mean, 955 Dreams, all our apps have had some form of YouTube embedded in it. Uh, and users enjoy using the uh, using apps that have been curated really well. So, I don't know, I guess if you're fishing for some sort of like, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong that they're doing per se. I mean, it's another form of curation mixed in with content that's already that already exists in uh, YouTube. And they're just surfacing some of those videos, and I think if it's if it's good for the users in the end, it it, it can't really be that that bad for them. I don't uh, know if that answers your question. Okay, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Thank you guys very much for coming. Uh, won't we come afterwards, and we could talk afterwards? Um, the hashtag for today is IO12. Uh, we'll be at the soundbacks afterwards, and can we give one more round of applause for all of our speakers? Thank you.